Hi guys, this is Alex from gsnom.com and we're here with a special anniversary phone. The Galaxy S series has become 10 years old and before we blow the candles, we're already seeing 5 new phones announced on February 20. One flexes the Galaxy Fold, one is a 5G unit and 3 of them are the Galaxy S10 models. So we're playing here with the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus, the best spec model of the triplet and it's being sold at around $1000 right now internationally. To make things clear we're dealing here with the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus Prism Green with dual SIM slots, an Exynos 9820 CPU, 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage. We've already shown you a hands-on of the device only a few days after debut and an unboxing that was pretty large. Now it's time for a detailed analysis. So here we go. At the end of 2018 we were wondering how Samsung is gonna crack the idea of a camera integrated in the screen. They were also supposed to show us a more edge-to-edge -edge screen compared to the Galaxy S9. Well the answer is here. They managed to cut the bezel from the top and the bottom and uh, that's because the sides were already cut and curved from the predecessor. Even more than that, they got rid of the iris scanning and also avoided a notch. They've done that by integrating the selfie camera right into the display via a cut with the laser into the glass of the AMOLED panel. People are pretty divided here because some of them do not like the idea of a hole in the screen and also there are people who don't even notice it. Plus there are some lovers of the idea. The first thing that I know here is that many people have started adopting funky and funny wallpapers to match the two eyes of the phone and the eyes of the characters on the screen fit the cutout in the display. We have several examples on the Galaxy S10 Plus right here. Moving on to more serious things, the overall format of the smartphone hasn't changed very much. We're still dealing with a glass and metal sandwich, with a premium build and an aluminum frame. There is Gorilla Glass 6 protection at the back and the front of the phone and the device has a diagonal which makes it closer to a Note rather than the standard Galaxy S. It sits perfectly in the hand, it fits your entire palm even though it has a big diagonal of 6.4 inches. It's not a slippery phone and you can wield it with a single hand courtesy of the new One UI interface. It's got a premium design for sure, it's very good looking and it's a Samsung achievement because it finally gets rid of the notch. It's also IP68 certified so it's resilient to water and dust. It weighs 175 grams which is stunning for a 6.4 inch diagonal and I think the ceramic version will also impress quite a few people. Moving on to the screen, Samsung is now showing us the dynamic AMOLED panel, a next generation panel here which has already received some awards from DisplayMate. We're dealing with a screen that supports HDR10 plus and offers a resolution of 3040 pixels over 1440 pixels and provides an aspect of 19 to 9. I have to say it's quite incredible to be watching videos on the screen, basically the colors will drip drop from the display and the action is very tangible, palpable. The contrast is excellent, the dynamic range and the palette of colors have a lot to gain courtesy of the new support for HDR10+. The pixels as shown under the microscope have a pental matrix arrangement and during our lux meter test we achieved 426 lux units. Which may not sound like a lot but in lab conditions and test conditions they have achieved 1200 lux units with the device. Which do not transfer to regular use on account of not damaging your eyes. So in regular conditions that's the value around 425-426 lux units. The contrast and legibility in the sunlight are excellent, we tested this thing even on the top of the mountains. The wide viewing angles are spot on and the black is very deep. There are multiple settings and calibrations for the colors, brightness and use modes for the display. Also the curved edges ensure immersiveness. So if you're wondering what HDR is all about, I recommend you watch a special HDR video on YouTube and you'll be totally blown away by the colors. It feels like magic. We move further into the hardware department where the king is an Exynos 9820 CPU plus 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage as well as a microSD card slot. In some parts of the world the Exynos is replaced by a Snapdragon A55 with the advantage of a 7 nanometer setup. So it's pointless for me to say that there's no lag here, Fortnite plays like a dream and it got a special skin once the Galaxy S10 was launched. So we also played with PUBG Mobile, Free Fire, Creative Destruction, Asphalt 9, 
all of them with ultra graphics, with a high level of frames per second and with no overheating. And of course, we didn't forget about the benchmarks. We put the 8 nanometer CPU to work and here we go. So, in Antutu 7 we were second placed all time with 332,388 points above the iPhone XR and the Huawei Mate 20 Pro and only below the iPhone XS Max. In Geekbench 4 Multicore we got as high as 10,386 points, which is the 4th place all time with only the iPhones from 2018 as challengers. In the graphical department we're doing quite fine, we're on the 8th spot in 3 d Mark Slingshot Extreme with 4468 points. In the subtest Vulcan we scored the 3rd place with 4294 points. The performance is top 5 level for sure and the temperature tests brought us good results. So, in GFX Bench we got at 35 degrees Celsius and in Riptide GP Renegade 32.4 degrees Celsius. So clearly there's no trace of overheating here. We also have a special FLIR sensor on the CAT S61 Rocket phone showing us a good heat dissipation with the hottest point of the phone being around the area of the Bixby button, where the CPU is but also where the heat pipe is. Now let's see how we're doing on the battery front. From starters it sounds excellent, 4100mAh for such a big diagonal. I should also mention we have fast charge support and wireless charge support plus support for reverse wireless charging. We can juice up headphones, watches and other handsets. We start off with the continuous video playback test in order to test the battery life and we achieve a gigantic 18 hours and 4 minutes which is the 7th placed phone all time and it also beats a few battery phones. Also, it beats any other Samsung phone we've ever tested in the video playback department. When it comes to continuous usage, I would say that 10 hours and 39 minutes in PC mark is excellent. It beats the Asus ROG phone, Galaxy Note 9 and Galaxy S9 Plus. Charging is no longer impressive at 1 hour and 42 minutes, because the Motorola Moto G7 Plus for example juices up in only 42 minutes. After 1 hour of charging we're at 77% though. There are power saving options including one based on a black and white interface. When it comes to entertainment, we're dealing with two stereo speakers, which were actually inaugurated last year with the Galaxy S9 series and continue to evolve on the Note 9 and the S10 Plus. There's a speaker at the bottom and the other one is the earpiece. We also receive headphones which were tuned by AKG and have a pretty solid wire, an inline remote and extra plugs. The speakers are of the weird sort which uh, when you're measuring them using a decibel meter show underwhelming results but in real life the ear will be more than satisfied. The notes are full, the bass is deep, the voices are crystal clear and everything checks out. The speakers complete each other perfectly, we have perfect stereophony and the space between you and the phone is filled by the musical notes. It will revolve around you with a pretty good imitation of actual surround. It's as immersive to the ear as the screen is for your eyes. The headphones are pretty comfy, they're pretty loud and seem to have a bit more bass than the last years. Fortunately there's still an audio jack in play. Also we have Dolby Atmos tuning with special options for gaming, musical genres, extra bass, treble and special sliders for various channels. Overall a pretty satisfying audio experience. And here we are in the camera department where we could actually write whole books about the features of the phone but I'm going to try to be more concise. So we're dealing with 5 cameras on the Galaxy S10 Plus, 2 at the front in that special cutout and 3 at the back. The back cameras sound similar to what we received on the Huawei Mate 20 Pro, only they're aligned in a line not a square. So the main sensor is a 12 megapixel shooter with a variable aperture between f1.5 and f2.4, it has optical image stabilization. Next up camera number 2. 12 megapixel again and uh, this time we're dealing with a telephoto lens and optical zoom 2x plus optical image stabilization. The third camera is a 16 megapixel shooter with ultra wide lens for the ample landscapes. There's also super slow motion filming at 960 frames per second, bokeh live focus capture and 4k filming in 60 frames per second plus a new super steady mode for boosted stabilization. Another novelty is the HDR10 plus filming. Speaking of bokeh, now Samsung has implemented 5 special effects, including a spiral one and a black and white background. When it comes to the dual selfie camera, we're using a combo of 10 megapixel and 8 megapixel sensors which are able to film in 4K. The second camera will aid you with a portrait bokeh capture. I also like the fact that in the menu, where you're switching between photo, video, panorama and portrait, you can personalize your favorite elements and leave there only the things you're actually using. And now it's time to check out some photo samples taken with the device. 
Charles O'Rear and his famous wallpaper photo of Windows XP come to mind when watching these photos taken with the Galaxy S10 Plus. In photos, we see the Bega Channel from the city of Timisoara in Romania and a special dam from a plant nearby. We also caught the name of the place on a special board when crossing a bridge. We photographed the river Bega with a wide camera and also the normal camera. We can notice the same vibrant colors and also the clarity is the same in the case of both setups. I would say that there is a slight oversaturation of the colors, but not by a huge amount. What's certain is that we got an ideal day for taking photos with a superb sky. It was the springtime. Just look at the combo of colors which are full of life, typical for the spring, and also with beautiful willow trees ready to show their leaves and the fishermen enjoying the warm rays of the sun. We didn't stop here, we went further and took photos of a cloudy sky in two other places. The first location is in the mountains of Semenik in Romania. It's a special place called Lindenfeld or the Lost Village. Basically, the village had some German colonists and the last inhabitant was registered over two decades ago. It's probable that the harsh conditions of access and the harsh winters led to the depopulation of the settlement. What's certain is that we had some difficulties in reaching Lindenfeld and a barrage of snow made us walk quite a bit and continue on foot. We hoped to find some flowers, bring some colors to the photo gallery taken with the phone. Instead, we caught some superb frames as if they were taken from the Ice Age, with melting snow under our very eyes. You can notice the empty houses, the sadness of the village and the church which expects its believers in vain. The second location is called Seget, it's in Hungary. We stopped there to photograph the Reok Palace, one of the attractions of the city. We also caught some frames with some excellent cakes served by a special candy shop at the base of the buildings. I'm going to show that later on. So the colors are a bit more blurred in the weather conditions that are less favorable, but even so the sky, the nature details and the details of the buildings are spectacular. Now let's show you some colors. We got a few flowers for you, plants dried up from the top of the mountain, but also grass on the edge of a brook. The first flower feels like it's been left by a lover on a bench before saying goodbye. It's a photograph which, if it were a painting, it would be pure art. The photo itself is not half bad. Then we see some magnolias in full bloom with little bees around them, captured on the edge of the river Bega, which we mentioned before. Details are excellent, you can see the texture of the wings of the bee if you zoom in, and I want you to notice that the S10 Plus did an exemplar job even with the sun in front of it, with a normal camera and a wide camera. Back to Lindenfeld, the lost village, I found a single flower and that's a savage one called the Eye of the Bull. It has petals which at their end are pink and uh, they actually predict the spring when there is no other flower in sight. In order to show you that the Galaxy S10 Plus also knows how to photograph red, we have some special Christmas plants, a carnation, but also rose hips on top of a rose filled with thorns. But we can notice very well the effect of natural depth of the Galaxy S10 Plus camera. For extra texture we have the photographs with the brambles with the summoning mountains in the background, but also the grass in front of water on the Poganish river. Back to the shot of the magnolia and the bee, we also did a burst shot and with the aid of the S10 Plus we managed to create an animated GIF which you can see here. I mentioned earlier that we photographed some cakes in the Hungarian town of Zeget in a cake shop. The name is the Artisanal Reok Cake Shop, if you want to visit it. And here are some of the wonders you can eat there. I haven't told you yet, but we actually did a comparison for uh, our sister site. The comparison was between the Huawei Mate 20 Pro, Google Pixel 3 XL and also the Galaxy S10 Plus. And we can already spoil the fun here, the Samsung phone beats everything when it comes to food. The photos of the Caesar salad from a local place in Bucharest have an excellent texture of the egg and the meat and the sauce will make you salivate for sure. I feel that the colors are less deformed than the Huawei Mate 20 Pro did last fall. There's actually no deformed colors at all. So basically a food blogger will be more than happy with the colors, the textures that the Galaxy S10 Plus catches. We can actually recommend the phone in that regard. So, we also tested the zoom which allows us to zoom out and also zoom in. So basically we can make the frame wider and take the subject further courtesy of the ultra wide camera, which catches a lot more details from the photograph subject compared to a regular camera. We have a bunch of examples in three steps for you. We've got a crane, we have a crow in the park, And we also have a shot of some fishermen on the river Bega in Timisoara. We 
we also have some curious bulls on the edge of a river and a house photograph from the top of the mountain with an excellent level of zoom. To be honest, quite amazing. We also tested the zoom capacity in low light conditions in Timisoara, where you can notice that the photos were taken 56 minutes after midnight. We didn't forget about the selfie part, where the folks of the Exomark have named the Galaxy S10 Plus as the best phone all time they ever tested. Where we're a bit more reserved, but think it's still a pretty good phone when it comes to selfie shots. I actually tested the portrait selfie and all the four modes that the camera app proposes, but we also photographed ourselves without the special effects that Samsung has to offer. Speaking of effects, you can actually use them for non-human subjects, like you can see with a little horse in the park. A toy horse, of course. We also have a special selfie taken at the top of the mountain in Lindenfeld, and also a photo of a youngster in a portrait shot, which was actually a comparison with the Pixel 3 XL and the Huawei Mate 20 Pro. And I actually felt that the Galaxy S10 Plus did a better job than its rivals in this regard. Also, I'm not a big fan of the new options that come with Bokeh, but I actually prefer them compared to the filters that Huawei Mate 20 Pro proposed last fall. I also would have liked something like special studio light features. To widen the palette of photos taken during the day, we have two panoramas. The first one is in Bucharest, capital of Romania. You can see the cubic stone of the ground, trees, the buildings, and a pretty well rendered sky. The second panorama is taken on the top of the mountain, where you can notice the roads, a beautiful sight, and a sky even if a bit cloudy. All of them are 100% shown by the phone, properly and in realistic mode. Low light shots were taken in Timisoara and Budapest, and we focused on historical buildings with decorative lighting. That's what we usually rely on when testing phones for their low light abilities. On a personal note, I'm pretty happy with the result, and I must mention again that the tone of the colors, the brightness and the colors themselves aren't changed when switching from one camera to the other. Also, I would like to highlight the white shots again, especially the Opera from Timisoara, where you can see a photograph of some old school bikes. This can only be achieved with a proper white camera, and we have two samples in that regard. Once again, we have a good white shot with a building that hosts the Lloyd restaurant and also the cathedral in the center of Timisoara caught with and without the ultra wide lens. We also caught on a photo the boy with the phone in the Liberty Square and also in the Unity Square we photographed the dome and a special pharmacy with a green hue in order to find out if the situation is well processed by the phone. I would say it's flawless and you can even notice the LEDs from the billboard and the cubic stone with the texture kept intact. The last building from Timisoara is the Millennium Church where we tested the flash capacity which was fine. Next up is Budapest, where we traveled especially to take some comparative shots with the Huawei Mate 20 Pro and the Google Pixel 3 XL. Thus, we can show you how the capital of Hungary looks like in the night time. We photographed the Bastion of the Fisherman. The Matthias Church. Or the Church of the Coronation in Budapest. We also photographed the Hungarian Parliament towards Buda over the Danube, but we caught that photo close up from the Pesta section where it actually is. We also wanted to capture the Hero Square where there's a beautiful monument, but during the midnight the illumination are turned down and we're left with this unchecked. Maybe next time. The Galaxy S10 Plus also has something lacking, like a special nighttime photo mode. With the AI feature on, it gets a sort of night mode, but it's only turned on when it's totally pitch black. We don't have a manual mode like the Pixel or the Mate. I find that overall the photos are a big upgrade from the Galaxy S9 Plus and the Note 9, especially thanks to the ultra-wide camera, which allows us to take photos like never before with a Samsung phone. The quality is excellent, especially in perfect conditions, and the foot shots are certainly not to be forgotten. A top-level camera. We didn't forget about the video capture, where Samsung had always a lot of rivals which are ready to go. The passage between the three cameras is easier done than on the Huawei Mate 20 Pro and the colors are excellently calibrated when filming in the park with those Disney toys. The exposure change is quite snappy and the zoom is handled ok. I don't feel that it cuts a part of the noise as fast as I would like to. We actually shot a video in Bucharest close to the golden hour, one hour before sunset and it was a panning. We saw objects in motion and things were excellent in focus, clarity and colors. We actually took the zoom level to the maximum and we almost barged into the houses of people, it was that detailed. 
There's also 4K video, 60 frames per second, which is perfect, even though the sun had already set and we just had the last rays reflected in the windows. We caught some pigeons in motions, with the slightest detail caught on camera, and I saw the best change of exposure when panning, which I ever witnessed. Ok, so let's talk about something weird now. We shot in motion when walking and noticed that the stabilization was pretty ok, even though in the edge areas and the distance areas we saw a bit more noise. We shot another video with a super steady mode on and either because it was already dark outside or some weird technological quirk, there was a bit of an extra shake compared to the filming without super steady. I actually enjoyed the filming and stabilization more without super steady. The 60 frames per second video is excellent and I also noticed that the moving objects are caught better and in a more cinematic fashion. And that's compared to the Huawei Mate 20 Pro which will deform colors more. We also have a 4K video with some bicycle people where I found that the background was a bit burnt and the dynamic range was controversial to say the least. In the focus test the things were very fast when switching from the background to the foreground and since it's a 4K video the water texture was basically perfect. There's also panoramic filming from the car, covering a large area and even showing off a capable zoom. In low light conditions, the lights appear to be enhanced and also the zoom is less impressive than during the day. The colors feel a bit too warm and the stabilization test shows us some image tremble, but not an excessive one. There are some extra reflections and the zoom is just ok up to let's say 3 or 4x. I should also remind you of the change of hue when switching between cameras. We put the microphone to the test by filming a musician in Budapest and catching the whole echo generated by the bastion of fishermen, the voices of the people and the ambience. Here I saw the image tremble in the full zoom, but the clarity was pretty ok. I find the street light halos of the lights a bit too big. The face of the violin player looks perfect in texture and color. We also did a supreme test, we filmed with the Galaxy S10 Plus, we get the Spa Golden Age Wellness in Hungary and the quantity of noise is really big inside but the water texture coming over the camera is quite nice. We can also see things pretty well underwater. Since the photographs convinced us that the Galaxy S10 Plus is the ultimate Galaxy S, I would say that the video needs a bit of work. During the night time the colors are a bit too warm, too yellow, super steady should be better and it actually does not feel like a boost, but I appreciate the colors, the zoom details and the passage between the cameras without problems. Normal mode stabilization is ok, but the video low light conditions can be beaten easily by 2 or 3 phones from the year 2018. We didn't forget about connectivity this year, there's USB Type-C 3.1 here, plus the audio jack and there are single SIM and dual SIM versions of the Galaxy S10 Plus. I should probably mention that the dual SIM model has a hybrid slot for the microSD or the SIM2 card. There's also support for the LTE category 20, Wi-Fi A, B, G and AC, plus Wi-Fi AX aka Wi-Fi 6, the new one. We also add to that GPS, GLONASS, Beidou and Galileo for the sake of global positioning. Of course there's NFC and Bluetooth 5.0. We tested the calls and they were crystal clear and the noise cancelling was spot on. The volume was rather high. We're also pretty curious about the speed test to see what the flagship can do in 2019. So we used the Orange Romania 4G network achieving 241 mega per second downloads and 65.9 mega per second uploads, pretty close to beating the records in this network. On Wi-Fi or at 450 mega per second download on a UPC Liberty Global subscription with a top level of 500 mega per second, so it's excellent. In upload we're at 25.2 mega per second on Wi-Fi. Thumbs up basically. When it comes to software there's not a lot to say if you're familiar with One UI and Android Pie on Galaxy Note 9 or the S9. The experience is basically the same, but let's see what it's all about. Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus runs on Android Pie with One UI on top. It brings a new interface based on tabs which were placed in the lower area of the screen. That way you can use the handset easily with a single hand and navigate with your thumb anywhere. The icons are minimalistic and they're lacking the gloss. Everything has been simplified to the core level. The gallery icon is a small little flower and that's basically the best example for the iconography. Everything is rounded, the menu of the Bixby aggregator has pill shaped areas and the same pill shaped departments are in the settings and notifications. There's still an always on display and new designs for the clock face. I'm not a big fan of the new multitasking, it involves a series of cards which are horizontally scrollable plus there's an extra step or two added for the multitasking. I should probably mention that Samsung already offered a bunch of software updates that fix the camera and the fingerprint scanner embedded in the screen. Speaking of which, 
The fingerprint scanner has been tested by us, it's an ultrasonic one and feels a bit slower than the OnePlus 6T one, but it doesn't bother me, to be honest. The unlock is easy and happens with a single touch. From what I understood, the fingerprint reader becomes smarter and faster after a period of usage. Face unlock is also part of the package, but there is no iris scanner now, so the system is easily fooled with pictures, videos and even a twin brother or two. Bixby is here as your virtual assistant, but it's still less than Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa. It has a dedicated physical button which can be reprogrammed to open other apps. I want to get back a bit to the One UI interface to tell you that the iconography feels huge, shockingly large when you first pick up the phone. I recommend you go to the settings and tweak it in size. We also have a night mode which offers darker theme, increased contrast and offers hues which will not affect your eyes or sleep if you're watching them during the night and in general they're more friendly with the eyes after the sunset. Night mode can be applied to the Bixby aggregator, the browser, notifications areas and quick settings. Samsung also tweaked a lot the resource optimization so you can do some extra tweaks of the battery and some things are happening in the background. Basically, there are multiple options here, including ones that will clean up your apps and settings every 24 hours and also they will get rid of the unused apps several days in a row. There are still the edge panels on the sides, pretty useless if you ask me, and there's also control with swipe gestures. So basically, you can replace your navigation buttons at the bottom with swipes, swipes at the top from where they would have been placed. There's also one hand usage, secure folder, game launcher and the gallery now hosts a sort of recycle bin. Something new in One UI, Android Pie on Samsung phones is the function of lift to wake, which strangely wasn't available till now. Pre-installed apps on the phone include the classical office mobile package from Microsoft as well as OneDrive, the Galaxy Store App Store, Samsung Members, Samsung Health, and smart things used to control the smart devices around the house. Plus there's an extra special skin for the game Fortnite that comes with the phone. Now we're off to the conclusion. Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus is the best looking Samsung phone till now, with the most generous battery when it comes to video playback and a camera that offers a bit of everything. The experiment that started with the Galaxy A9 2018 is now complete, with the best ultra wide camera on the market. Samsung finally takes selfies at the level of a proper flagship. It has convincing bokeh. The performance is top 5 material and it can beat any other Android rival with ease. The acoustics are satisfying. The phone sits perfectly in the hand and it has an excellent screen for video consumption. These are the pro aspects of the phone. When it comes to the cons, I would mention the lack of proper fast charging and I feel that the much praised super steady mode isn't actually that good when stabilizing the video capture. I could do without the new bokeh effects and the lack of a special nighttime capture mode can be felt. Low light video capture is the Achilles heel of the phone, to be honest. The fingerprint scanner isn't the best on the market, but it also doesn't have very solid rivals. Maybe except from the Huawei P30 Pro one. One UI will polarize a lot of people with giant icons and split screen that's not very comfortable and Bixby is below Google Assistant. Still, Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus is a phone that corrects all the things that were bad from Galaxy S8 to the S9 and onwards. It doesn't afford any missteps and it doesn't take them. It's excellent in areas like design, display, photos, gaming and multimedia. It's only the power users and the photo and video maniacs that will find some drawbacks, especially in the video capture I would say. The Galaxy S10 Plus is a much larger upgrade from the Galaxy S9 Plus compared to the Galaxy S9 versus the S8. It's the maximum that you can require from Samsung after 10 years of innovation.